So, ladies and gentlemen, um, I hope uh, you had a good break <laughs> after such uh, a storm of information before the break. Uh, what I want to say is that uh, I'm going to make available my slides. I've been waiting on the slides until uh, half an hour before I started because on the train I always fizzle, fiddle about my PowerPoints always till the last minute. So that's why I didn't give it before. But don't worry, tomorrow I'll send it to Stefan and uh, you will get everything. For people who want to know my coordinates, my official name is Joseph Dekkers. If you want to Google my name uh, on, on ResearchGate or something, and then my official email is Seppe. Seppe comes from Joseph, the Italian Giuseppe. Uh, yeah, right. So now uh, we have been discussing Central Africa, Western Africa. Unfortunately, I can not pay much attention to the northern part, even though I wish, I mean, again, that's such an exciting area. But we will now go from the Nile, we will follow the Nile from uh, the lower Egypt and then up to the source of the Nile, of course, because that's a, a, a fascinating part of Africa, which very nicely illustrates how that old continent on the Kraton Precambrium complex all of a sudden is rejuvenated by new materials which are coming from very deep seated uh, areas in our uh, globe and uh, fresh volcanic material from very deep uh, mantle material in fact usually is literally an enrichment an enrichment of uh, the soilscape. So here you can see a landside picture of uh, the Nile Delta and um, here you can see some of the archaeological um, eras and then the Nile itself, a very fertile valley. Why is the Nile Delta and the whole Nile Valley so fertile? Of course, the philosopher Herodotus has already uh, uh, mentioned that 2,000 years ago that Egypt is the present of the Nile. It is benefiting from all the sediments from soil erosion in the riparian countries and more particularly Ethiopia and Uganda and the other countries and all that fertility is uh, every year with the rainy season flooding the Nile. Now of course now the Nasser Dam has been built and that is of course keeping all that fertility in a dam so that the result is that the soils are still there but the delta itself is shrinking and is in fact collapsing so to say. So uh, that fertility cycle now has been uh, broken. But the soils here very strongly relate to uh, their era of origin and 80% of the water of the Nile here is in fact originating from Ethiopia. And in Ethiopia you have that volcanic kind of basalt lithology giving rise to, uh, to one clays that's completely different from all the clays we have been discussing before that are active clays. The most active on my scale of the cation exchange capacity we are going here from less than 16 uh, in the feral soils to uh, close to 100. So there, that is extremely highly active clay chemically and also physically. That's why you have the swell and the shrink. And uh, the same kind of uh, uh, activity you will find here in the soils. So, but they are originating from a river body, deposited by a river. So on the map you will find them as fluvy soils. And uh, which qualifier, which adjective can we add to that? Vertic, of course, because they are still showing that kind of swell shrink. Um, and of course, if the water is not more flooding anymore, those soils, they will eventually develop in the future. Soils are always changing in the landscape. Uh, what would be the best bed soil then, Stefan? Maybe Feozems? Uh, will develop in, or they may even develop into anthrosols. Hortic anthrosols, perhaps. I'm just dreaming loudly. I have not visited Egypt. I'm just thinking theoretically what kind of soil evolution would be there. So let's now go to the source of the Nile. Huh? And uh, just a little word on the Rift Valley. 
the Rift Valley, East African Rift Valley, goes all the way here from the Red Sea, Gulf of Aden, here below sea level, up to uh, 1,300 meters, 700 meters here, central Ethiopia. Then it goes down again, then in, in Kenya, it will go to 2,400 meters above sea level, but still the valley on Lake Naivasha in um, Kenya. And then it splits up here into two, uh, that is the western part, the eastern part with Lake Manyara, etc., Tanzania, and then it ends up in Lake Malawi to uh, stop there. So that's a huge feature, and it basically speaking is what we call a graben, resulting from the eastern part here, which is sagging away from Africa. So uh, that started that movement something like 30 million years ago, and it still continues. In Ethiopia, this is the Rift Valley in Ethiopia. You can see when there is a Rift Valley, there is an area which is going down, and on the shoulders of the Rift Valley, due to the push down, you get a kind of isostatic uh, balance, restoring, and the shoulders always move up. So that means that in Ethiopia, for instance, on the sides of the Rift Valley, altitudes typically above 4,000 meters. Here you will have more than 5,000 meters, and uh, I mean, you always find that kind of difference. So on average, the Rift Valley bottom 1,000 meters, then 2,400, 3,000 meters on the shoulders is always a common feature. That changes then, of course, the rainfall patterns. Eh? Rainfall will fall more on the shoulders and much less here in the center. Here you will find soils typically for dry conditions. So Solonchak, Solonets, uh, uh, Cambisols, and here you will find on the shoulders soils developed from basalt in a moist climate. They be basalt withers very fast in a matter of 5,000 years. It will develop into a beautiful nitty soil, or sometimes even in a feral soil in a matter of 5 to 10,000 years. Can you imagine? On a geological time scale, this is very fast. So let's look how that works out. This is the flood basalt in Ethiopia. It's a huge, unbelievably huge era, area. This is going down, this is going up. This is the flood basalt. Is it thick? Yes, it's unbelievably thick. There are places where that is about 1,000 meters thick, more particularly here. In other places, it's only a few meters thick. And uh, by looking at the landscape, you can find the volcanoes from where it is, was coming. So it is really unbelievable. That's how it looks like. Here you can see the basalt flows. And uh, very commonly, the Rift Valley is not just one big step. It's in steps, like that. They call that step faulting. And uh, it, that leads to unbelievable differences in soils, of course, in geomorphology. I tell you, it is very exciting to work in such an area and uh, to map, to look at these soils. And uh, here you can see again, in the lower part of the Rift Valley, this is close to one of the big lakes. It's plenty of wild animals, but it is also a very good grazing area. So there are these nomadic tribes like the Maasai, which are running around there with huge flocks of livestock uh, next to then wild animals and uh, ecotourism. This basalt is, as I said, a present out of heaven. And that is depicted very nicely in this uh, slide. Here you have a coincidence where you have on the, one, on the left hand side some granite rock and here you have a basalt. Here the soil is almost nothing. And in the same time, in a matter of 10,000 years, you have a meter stick soil developed here, most likely a nitty soil. This is a shallow leptosol, shallow soil. This is a deep, beautiful soil. And you can even see from the plant growth that there is an enormous difference in between those two soils. So the whole area of East Africa of Ethiopia, Tanzania, Kenya, some part of Zambia, some part of Mozambique are covered by these beautiful basalts and therefore the fertility is there. This is Lake Tana. Lake Tana is the result of a beautiful old valley which all of a sudden was blocked. 
I believe it was blocked by one of these uh, faults and a block came up and just chopped the valley in the middle together with some basalt flows. And that is one of the biggest water bodies in East Africa on the Ethiopian highlands now. It is the source of the Blue Nile. It's not deep, it's only something like 10 meters deep. A lot of sediment coming in, so in a matter of 1,500 to 2,000 years, the whole lake will be gone, I'm afraid, if the land degradation continues. So, so that's a big issue, I think. Um, but it's a very important lake for Egypt, for all the riparian countries, for the water supply, of course, and for the sediment supply. This is the outlet of the lake when I was working in Ethiopia during the dry season. Now hold on to your bones. This is the outlet during the rainy season. Once more the contrast. So all that sediment is going down the Nile and forms the beautiful vertic fluvisols, which is lining the Nile and coming into the delta with a huge potential. If you can irrigate two times per year, you can produce something close to 16 tons of fresh grains, plus all the biomass. That's enormous. It's an enormous resource. But why should we let all that fertility go down the valley? It's much, much better to preserve it because it comes from these soils. Beautiful reddish soils. The nitty soils. Ever heard of the nitty soils this morning? But you were not explained why they are called nitty soils. Nitty soils that's resulting from a, a discussion from my predecessor, Professor Dudal and uh, Brinkman, who is one of the professors from Wageningen. They were together in Indonesia discussing these beautiful deep soils developed from basalt. And they say, look, the clay mineralogy looks like the feral soils from Congo. But the difference is that on these soils, you can produce 10 tons of cereals per hectare and on the Congo one, only one ton, or 1.5, or two ton in the best case. So what's the difference? It relates to mineralogy, and there is a slight little swell shrink in these soils, which results in a little bit of a shiny soil structure. If you take the soil structure apart, it looks as though you are looking into a little bit of a mirror. So which Latin word reflects that mirroring of the light? Nitidus. So that's where the word comes from. They coined the word nitisol by their observations in the field and linking actually the potential of the soil, the management of these soils, and uh, I think it was very well chosen. At that time, soil taxonomy had only the oxisols, and all of a sudden they realized that in the oxisols they have very strange bedfellows together. They have the soils which are like these ones and then all the others from the Brazilian plateau. So all of a sudden they had to do something about it and that's how they came in the soil taxonomy to the Candic horizon. Candic horizon qualifies for this horizon the nitic properties in the world reference base. Just a little story to tell you how classification systems have been helping each other eh, to come to a better description of the nature of the reality and related to management. Now if we come to the lower areas, what we saw here, that was the plateau situation. Huh? You can see beautifully drained soils. Let's now go to the lowlands close to Lake Tana. The nitty soils were here on top, now we are here in the lowlands. At the end of the rainy season, the farmers have left it into grassland. Why grassland? Because the soils were difficult. They perhaps could use it for growing certain grassy kind of crops, I'll show you later, but it's easier. Those farmers, they all have their own livestock, zero grazing livestock. They want in the dry season something to feed to this livestock. So here they can cut and carry the grass into their stables and produce and harvest the organic matter to use it in their home gardens. But some of the soils are cultivated by oxen usually a pair of oxen. So here you can see them cultivating the vertisols here in the lowlands. Here the vertisol itself with the typical cracks, shiny pet faces, 
and uh, sometimes they plow too much and then you get what we call a plow pan that's a problem which was not recognized until very recently but we now know that something like 20 30 percent of the ethiopian highland vertisols have this plow pan and the result is that instead of uh, having a beautiful deep soil all of a sudden you are having a very shallow soil and your yield level is going down yes is the plow pan not interrupted by correcting in the dry season? yes for sure but at a certain moment people are plowing up to 10 times at the beginning of the rainy season when the soil is swelling and at that time you bring your plow pan there for that season and indeed in the dry season it will crack again but then your crop has already failed so what i want to say is that in that very season you work on a shallow soil until it starts drying out and that's too late then for the roots to go deeper here so that's a very big problem which is not recognized the sustainability problem which we can solve now because i have always been wondering why on heavens in Ethiopia are they never touching more than 1.5 tons of whatever wheat, barley, I mean uh, horse beans, uh, teff eragrostis abyssinica, the typical staple from Ethiopia At, and I think part of the answer is here the plow pan apart from chemical problems as well Another particularity of the vertisols, this is a beautiful one from the Lake Tana. Do you see all these patches of dark and uh, light green? If you go over that terrain, it looks like an undulating landscape. They call that Gilgai. Gilgai are, is a wavy kind of topsoil which is coming as a result of the swell shrink in the subsoil so it is growing from the subsoil and whenever you want to say I'm going to level this for maybe planting a certain crop or maybe you want to level it because you want to have an airstrip for landing your airplanes after one or two years the undulating pattern will come back I have witnessed that in Addis Ababa I have landed tens of times in Addis Ababa since 1980 in Ethiopia it's located on such a vertisol and once every five years all of a sudden they scraped off the tarmac leveled it again and then they put the tarmac again and I have seen that happening three times then I was on my frequent flyer cart flying first class and I was sitting next to the manager of Ethiopian Airlines and I told him now I'm going to tell you a secret huh? Do you know that problem with your airport? Yes, he said, and I don't know what to do about it. I said, look, as a soil scientist, I recommend you to take out all that vertisol. Oh, but that's too much work, he said. I said, look, what is the cost of immobilizing your airport, which is ever growing bigger? So eventually they did. They took out all that soil, put nitisol instead, red soil, and now the airstrip is stabilized so the economical cost in terms not only of airport but also of road construction is enormous there that has nothing to do with the sustainability for farmers but more of the civil technical and housing houses will crack eh? it's a quite a challenge to build in such an environment so do take that into account if you're consulted for whatever urban development eh? these soils are very challenging so here you can see the cracks so and this is the crop which the farmers can grow on the vertisols this is Eragrostis abyssinica it's a grass species they call it teff and it's like a grass it's a real grass in fact they harvest the seeds and they grind it into power there is kind of a fermenting process and uh, they make these beautiful pancakes with the beautiful sauces and whatever they want to prepare in the kitchen it's really beautiful the only problem is you have about 1.5 to 2 million hectares out is about 20 percent of the Ethiopian uh, agricultural area which is grown to this crop 
and the average yield is around one ton per hectare. So that's far too little. In a country which is importing between one to five million tons of cereals every year to feed the 90 million people, you really wonder if the land use is correct to uh, plant this crop. I have always argued, why don't you uh, do a surface management with this vertisol so that you can grow maybe maize and then you have a sixfold of your yield potential. That's possible. But this is a culture embedded in the culture and it's very difficult to uh, convince those people that maybe it's better or ethically better to eat wheat or barley or something rather than teff because you compromise really due to the fact that the yield potential of that crop is very low. That's what we could call social sustainability. Eh? I mean, it's a socio-cultural habit, which is in fact making this country starving from hunger because of the, of the problem of uh, a deep-seated culture, which is difficult to change. With all respect, of course, for this culture. So now I'm taking you to the south um, western part of Ethiopia. It's a kind of uh, incised basalt plateau. The whole area is uh, something like 2,000 up to 2,400 meters above sea level. We are in the western uh, shoulder of the Rift Valley. You can see here uh, an old volcano. Soils are typical nitty soils. Look at the deep rooting of that soils. The only land degradation hazard in that area, it's a kind of an undulating pattern uh, um, relief, is landslides. A lot of landslides are occurring in the area due to the deforestation. And then of course with the landslides a lot of sediment is mobilized and is in fact compromising all the dams which are they are making on, on big rivers like on the Omo. There are three dams staggered. Uh, also on the Blue Nile there are dams being built and that's of course really uh, very problematic that all that sediment is in fact coming into these dams. How can you stabilize such things, such uh, landslides by having as much as possible the permanent vegetation there? And this is an example of how that can be done. Here you can see the nitisol with the coffee grown under natural trees. The coffee forest is one of these examples. And I have always been surprised how much coffee these farmers are touching from such a forest. You would say, yeah, under a forest there must be competition for water, for light and everything. Yeah, that's true. And these coffee trees, they are quite tall. Eh? So how in heavens do they harvest the coffee? If I compare that coffee with Tanzania, they have the small little coffee plants which they are cutting and pruning and they, here they don't care that the coffee is growing. When it comes to harvesting time, they take the tree and they pull it down and pick the coffee, whoops, and the tree goes up again. They touch 1,500 to 2,000 kilograms of fresh coffee. How much they touch in Tanzania? Something like three or 400 kilograms. So economically speaking, bio coffee here is better for the pocket of the small farmers but it is also better for the preservation of your soilscape and it is also better to curb the problem of landslides and it is better for biodiversity for sure because all nature can survive like this. So I, I really think this is a beautiful case. Coffee, Kaffa, this is Kaffa region. The name coffee comes from this region. Yeah? Nitty souls and coffee. That you have to remember, they go always together. That happens also in Cameroon, in West Cameroon, the best coffee is coming from the Niti Souls. Of course, there is coffee growing. I'm talking now of Arabica coffee. That is the best coffee. Usually in Belgium, we drink a mix of Arabica and Robusta. That is the lowland coffee from Brazil or from Vietnam and, and from other kinds of soils. But the best coffee for Arabica coffee soils are the nitty souls and this is an example of how a beautiful combination of biodiversity and coffee is going hand in hand in a perfectly conserved uh, ecosystem. Now you can't talk about East Africa without thinking of geotectonic fracturing. The whole area is in fact one big scenario of huge fault lines 
rift valleys, graben, uplifted mountains, etc. So I took it a little bit separate now. We are getting out of the Nile system and coming into one of these tectonic gravels. Here you can see the picture of those graben. Huh? And let's move here into the Danakil depression, one of these hottest and lowest places of the world, which, oh, oh yeah, this is again one, one little uh, slide showing the origin of the Graben itself. So 30 million years ago, we had a huge basalt flow coming from certain number of volcanoes uh, at the beginning of uh, the uh, Graben formation. And slowly, slowly, the whole system is pulling itself. East Africa is moving towards the Indian Ocean. And this is the stage in which we are now. Here is Lake Baringo. You have the, in the center of the Rift Valley, you have little volcanoes which are erupting. And in Ethiopia, you have the only volcano which has a, vo la a lava lake. That's the Erta Ale. It's a glowing lava. And in Ethiopia, that movement uh, east-west is going very fast. There is in the Afar uh, a little story that there is a little uh, furrow somewhere in the landscape. And in order to pass, they have put a little plank. And usually when they come next morning, the plank has dropped down because it has already uh, gone open so much. That's perhaps a little tale, but I do know from my literature that on average, on average, it is going open by 17 centimeters per year. That's huge. That's enormous. And I have known one time, one night, where in Ethiopia I felt uh, an earth tremor. And all of a sudden, some 40 kilometers from the place where I was, there was a big crack in the earth, 50 kilometers long, 8, kilome eight uh, meters wide, and 10 meters deep. So in, it's not going every day, of course. It is always with faults, with shocks, that this happens. Usually you don't have very strong tremors because it's an era where not tensions are built up, this uh, pressure releases. So, and that results, of course, in ashes being flying around, in volcanic uh, volcanoes erupting once in a while, like the Niriangongo in Congo, like uh, Oldonio Lenga in Tanzania, that are all examples of volcanoes which erupt once in a while and then refresh the soil scene with fresh materials. Oldonio Lenga is not such a happy uh, deposit because there are ashes which are alkaline. So Lake Natron, Lake Magadi in Kenya, Tanzania have a very high pH due to that volcano. But in other places, it is much more of a balmy kind of uh, uh, ash dressing we are getting, so generally speaking, it's in favor for the soils. But let's now go to the lowest place here in Africa. That is the Dalol depression in the Danakil Desert. This is Lake Tana as a reference. This is the lowland close to uh, Eritrea in Ethiopia we are going to go to. So this is, this is the picture at uh, sunrise. 125 meters below sea level, ladies and gentlemen. It takes a rough day driving down or going on foot on camels through a rift valley all the way down there. And uh, it's soaring hot there, 55 degrees Celsius under the thermometer hut, under the shade. So it is um, very, very hot indeed. These are salt crusts which are formed. This lake, this uh, lowland is in fact flooded every every year during the rainy season with fresh salty water which has percolated a very large area and is accumulating like an, we call that an endorheic system. All the salts from the whole catchment are coming together here in this graben. And due to the, due to the crystallization of the salts you get uh, a growth of the salts and they hydrate and therefore they become larger the crystals they push each other and that's why you get all these polygonal structures here here you can see our cars with the polygonal structures it looks like ice eh? you can walk on it and this is a salt mountain you know the biblical story of flood which couldn't uh, look behind because you would change in a piece of salt that's what could happen here. Eh? 
So due to the lateral uh, movement of the salt, some, in some places you get huge mountains like this building of salt, which are uh, moving up. So which kind of soils would that be here? From what you learned this morning. Salts. Strong expression of salts. Ever heard of Solonchak? Solonchak, it's the Russian name for that. Eh? And then hypersalic, that means it's just the highest salt concentration you can have because it's almost complete 100% salt. Eh? Is that land useless? No, it's not useless. Here you can see some Ethiopian uh, people under the guidance of Afar, which come there with their camels. They harvest every year the fresh layer of salt here at the top. They harvest it. They cut it into small pieces. Here you can see the process. It's that five, six centimeter layer salt, which is then ferried all the way on the back of the camels to the highlands, all the way to Khartoum in Sudan, to Kenya, to uh, large highlands of Ethiopia. Is it healthy to eat these salts? Okay. Yes. Huh? Absolutely. It's healthy. It's healthy. It's healthy. It's yeah. And is it healthy, you think? No. Why not? Well, it is healthy. It is go as good as, as kitchen salt, but it's, it's lacking one thing. If, you, it, if it does not come from the sea, it is lacking iodine. Iodine, which is important for your thyroid gland. So the people who are living on that salt only without other input from somewhere else, they develop the goiter, which is a big swelling here that I have seen quite commonly in the interlands, in fact. So in that way, I think you're right. It is not so healthy. So here you can see the caravans with the salts. They come with the salts out and they go with feet back into the Rift Valley. It's a very beautiful piece of culture. Now they have found economically in large quantities uh, sodium, uh, no, potassium chloride and potassium sulfate in the same environment. So they are starting to mine now. They have also discovered natural gas and they are looking for oil as well. So uh, that area is bound to have some of these resources. I do hope that they will be able to exploit it in a clean way because otherwise a very beautiful piece of fragile land may uh, uh, come at stake. I cannot uh, go uh, in detail further in Ethiopia, but further south again, you have all these volcanics. This is Lake Victoria. You have here all these beautiful lakes and here the Mount Kilimanjaro, and Gorongoro crater. Let me just show you a few pictures of uh, the beautiful soils of the Kilimanjaro. The Niti soils again on basalt here. Kilimanjaro, an icon of a shield volcano, very wide, 80 kilometers wide, 40 kilometers deep, close to 6,000 meters. This is a little volcanic plaque of the latest eruption. And the coffee belt is under the trees here. So again, Arabica coffee with the Kihamba farm. This is a Kihamba farm with the trees. Then you have the small shrubs, you have the bananas, the coffee. This is the yams and underneath some vegetables. So all kinds of layers of vegetation. I would say this is looking like an icon of sustainability. Yeah? Keep the soil covered and um, you can make a living on a sustainable way of these farms. Now, if you plant them to agricultural crops in this area, you can touch really the highest yields. If you manage to uh, come to, to uh, get about the problem of phosphate fixation because these soils they have an unbelievable phosphate fixating capacity so how can you uh, curb that problem of phosphate fixation high quantity of organic matter I have done the experiment myself I worked for three years on the Kilimanjaro under the FAO and was working with farmers on how to bring up their yields original yields were something like 1000 2000 kilograms per hectare for maize and uh, with a crop rotation, with Scrotularia sunhemp, bringing in large quantities of organic matter, farmyard manure from the zero grazing systems here, 
and that with small quantities of rock phosphate or mineral phosphate with a bit of nitrogen, we could touch up to eight tons of maize per hectare, which is very, very high indeed. And one crop and the next, uh, I mean two crops per year, one, one season the maize, the next season beans. So uh, high intensive farming systems, eh? little patches of agricultural field in between the coffee and the Kihama systems here. So what's fixing the phosphorus in the soil? Uh, it is actually the iron oxides. And then uh, you have uh, sometimes a negative uh, exchange capacity on these soils, on the clay itself. It's a very low activity clay. So uh, the negative uh, sites on the clay complex is to a certain extent on the low activity clays, uh, the kaolin type, and most of it on the oxides, aluminium and iron oxides. And if you bring the pH of the soils above a certain level, usually close to 6.5, that negative uh, exchange capacity is gone. Then you don't have more phosphate fixating capacity and all the phosphate becomes available for the crops. So work on the pH and then work on the organic matter because the organic matter is again an enormous quantity of uh, of uh, Sorry, I was talking about the, the positive charge which is developing on the clay complex. So uh, that is the negative charge which you have to increase by bringing up the pH of the soil to the above the point of zero net charge and then bringing organic carbon which even adds more negative uh, charges. Okay, so that's the principle. Am I correct, Stefan? So, uh, yeah, this is a typical Arabica. And here you can see the contrast with the previous slides. This is a Tanzanian farm with the coffee very small, kept pruned and everything. And still they are making less money here on the coffee than what the uh, forest farm is doing in, in Ethiopia. So that's quite an interesting uh, thing. That, But here, again, under shade. Eh? Now, there is quite a complex part of East Africa, which people call the Mozambique Belt. The Mozambique Belt is in fact uh, the eastern part of Tanzania, Mozambique, some parts of Kenya, uh, Moza uh, the Taita Hills, Mombasa. And um, it is um, set by what the people call the East African Arch Mountains. So that are highlands, which are spread all over the place, which are non-volcanic. Here you have the volcanoes, Kilimanjaro, Meru, Gorongoro, Mbulu, Hanang, etc. Here you have non... So why are they uh, sticking out of the landscape? What is their original? Well, they link to the East African uh, kind of tectonic systems, but they are non-volcanic. So it is just some fracture zones with uplifts and warping down, but without having the benefit of volcanoes. So the principle is Horst and Graben, that's how the earth crust is in fact by pressures and pull and push uh, moving up and down. So in one place all of a sudden a mountain is formed over the last 50, 30 million years linked with the East African um, um, Rift Valley but a little bit away from the volcanoes. The result is an area where all of a sudden these soils, which you normally find, you find them 1,000 or 2,000 meters higher. Still the same soils are there. Of course, due to the fact that these soils are higher, you get a big forest developing, you get more rainfall, you get soil erosion. So in order to understand those landscapes up here, you have to understand what is happening here and then have maybe some millions of years of soil erosion and other processes superimposed on the landscape and then all of a sudden you will recognize yourself and you will have a, a clue to how to start mapping these soils. Yeah. So I'm taking you now to a case where I was working with some colleagues, the West Uzambara Mountains. Uzambara is actually one of these arch hills, arch mountains, 
which form the northern part of uh, eastern Tanzania, close to the border of Kenya. Kenya is here where the yellow stripe is. Here is the uh, Uzambaras in Tanzania. The level at the bottom here is 550 meters above sea level. And at the top here, it goes to 1,700 meters. So it is more than a 1,000 meter jump in the landscape. This is how it looks like in reality. So here I see sisal growing here in the Maasai Plains. And then all of a sudden you have the jump up here and up here. You have the vegetable garden of Tanzania because due to the balmy climate up there, all of a sudden you can do a lot more with the land than what you can do in a semi-arid uh, environment. The soils in the place, down and up in equilibrium, is this red soil. Feral sol, rhotic feral sol, is developed from gneiss. So in the feral sols, the red color again is a sign of a little bit being better than the yellow feral sols, I would say. Or you have the reddish soils. I can see here some weathering gneiss closer to the surface. So therefore, they are still cambi sols. Chrom feralic cambisols. And here you can see my colleague, Professor Kemaro from the University of Morogoro, showing that a lot of sideways materials have been moving in the landscape. How else could it be in a hilly landscape? So the, a lot of these feral soils are buried underneath colluvium, either colluvium caused by man cultivating the land, because if you cultivate in, the, in, in a mountain, of course, you are pulling the sediment and some other parts are covered. Yeah? And this is another interesting, the, uh, whole, the whole area is of course hilly, farmers are aware of soil erosion, they are very much interested in zero grazing livestock keeping at home, so they need fodder throughout the year. How do they grow their fodder? by the so-called miraba. Miraba is elephant grass, which they are planting here in, uh, or elephant grass in into a square around their plot in order to demarcate their property, but also to conserve the soil. So whenever they do cultivation, the soil is always not moving further than the miraba here. Elephant is a very strong grass, they can cut it, it grows immediately again, and with this little extra colluvium here, the emiraba will grow even better. So they serve two purposes, they feed their livestock, and they can serve the soil. As a result, you get colluvium, buried soils here at the bottom, and soils which have been truncated or cut off here at the top. So you end up after 20, 30 years into a kind of a stepped landscape due to the Mirabas. So in FAO, in the World Reference Base, there is a little qualifier for this stepwise kind of uh, landscape, which is due to, so thanks to soil conservation, we call that escalic. That means the steps in the landscape, yeah? Escalic feral soils, you can have escalic anthrosols, you can have escalic flixisols, whatever. All right? So that's quite an interesting evolution, I would say, thanks to soil conservation. And the farmer is getting better off by doing such an exercise. This is the valley bottom. Be aware, we are 1,700 meters above the Maasai Plain, eh? In the valley bottom of the Maasai, I found plintite. Where did I find the plintite in this landscape? I went to look for it, eh? and I found it. It was no more in the bottom of the landscape, but it was somewhere here in the hills I found the plintite layer. The plintite is my reference of the old soil, but the plintite had already been eroded, the river valley was deeper, there had been a lake, here and due to the lake we had a flat bottom land here. I'm telling you a lot of stories. I really researched that area. I can tell you that's how it was. With clay rich material at the bottom and a shallow water table 
and that's where the Tanzanians, the Uzambaras, the Samba, they call it, are growing vegetables for Dar es Salaam, for Nairobi, for Mombasa, for export. Very interesting. But they run out of fertilizer, so what did they do? They went into the forest here, something like 20, 30 percent of the area is still under forest, and they just then go and steal the little layer from the forest and apply it here. Year after year after year after year, do deep cultivation. They drain every square, little square of land. Every farmer is having this land, sometimes with miraba, sometimes without miraba conservation. And in the end of the day, we have what we call a man-made soil developing, an anthrosol. Here you can see it. This is the original soil, and here is the stolen soil from somewhere else. What did we do in Belgium? What did we do in the Netherlands? Exactly the same. We stole the soil from somewhere else and made it fertile there. That's how anthrosols, plagen soils here in the Netherlands, have been developing, and in the Uzambaras, we call them teric anthrosols. When we were making the soil atlas of Africa a few years ago, people were claiming there are no anthrosols in Africa. I said, take beg your pardon? Here they are. So now they are in the atlas, and I'm sure if we look further around, we will find more, because as man is having more, in, more influence, there are bound to be developing more anthrosols in Africa as well. So here you can see the vegetables on the anthrosols. I can see spinach, I can see the cabbage, I can see tomatoes, there is paprikas, whatever. Eucalyptus is there, and there are even temperate pears growing because we are at high altitude and above 2,000 meters. All of a sudden you, you can grow temperate fruits there. And again, this is a cash crop. Eh? Farmers will not cultivate that for themselves. That is being ferried, plums as well. So with a bit of imagination, you can really do a lot of things there. Now I'm going to take you to the southeastern corner. There's so much in between. Unfortunately, I cannot show you that. But let me show you this one, close to the Indian Ocean. The Makonde area, southeastern Tanzania, Mtwara, Lindi regions. You can see from the topographic map that the area is also a little bit mountainous. It's actually a plateau. It is an area which has been benefiting from terrestrial deposits over the last 30 million years ago. Some few hundreds of meters of river deposits from the Ruvu River has developed here. And then it was in the East African tectonic movement uplifted here along fault lines. And this is now 1,000 meters above sea level and it goes down to sea level here at the Indian Ocean uh, level. Here you can see on the clouds, you can see here in the morning, 1,000 meters, there are more clouds here. This is forested and the whole area is one big area of cashew nuts. Cashew nuts which have been starting to grow there in the uh, early 50s of previous century, brought from Brazil by the Portuguese. And uh, soils are not uniform at all. Eh? Look here, these are soil shapes we have been mapping here. You can look at the colors, I cannot go in detail here. But on the coastal plains you, you do have, oh, excuse me, that's going too fast now. Eh? On the coast, you have some arenosols, you have some uh, dissected plateaus with some old coral reefs in which you develop beautiful feral soils. If you go further inland, you can uh, find uh, arenic acr acrisols, a lot of sand. They are very sandy, the soils, but with a clay uh, mm -hmm. bulge. And uh, in the highest plateau situations, you find sandy feral soils. Soils very deeply stretched, in which the cashew nuts really do very well. It's typically an area where you can grow cashew nuts. It's reasonably, reasonably acidic, the soils, due to a huge quantity of rainfall on sandy soils, more than 2,000 millimeters of rainfall. So therefore, the soils are chemically vulnerable to acidification, which crop would grow in such uh, fruit crop. Uh, pineapple does very well in such circumstances. So, uh, very interesting. And then in the 
green patches here are some vertisols. So vertisol sometimes on old lacustrine deposits. So you would say at first glance on the soil map of Africa, they all look as alike. But if you start going a little bit more in detail, you really discover very interesting landscapes, each of which with particular opportunities and particular uh, vulnerabilities. So the cashew is cultivated very well. It's an area where fallow systems are there and bushfires are quite common. To a certain extent, cashew can resist, but not too strong fires then, of course, preferably. This is the soils. Feral soils and arenic in between brackets, or acrisols and arenic in between brackets. That means you do have a little bit of a clay increase in the subsoil and the sandy character is really prominent all over the world. Certainly the topsoil is uh, very sandy. So whenever there is a bushfire, the trees of course do suffer quite a lot, but they don't kill the trees. They will leave the stems behind because the stems will be needed for regeneration of the fields. So after three, four years uh, of cultivation, the fertility is gone, the ashes, fertility from the ashes is gone, and then uh, the trees will rejuvenate, and then after five, six years, they come back again and start an, again a cultivation cycle. So on eight years, eight to ten years, maybe three or four years maximum, it's cultivated, and then five, six years, of uh, uh, bush fallow. Here you can see the farmer planting in between the stumps of the trees and he or she is planting everything together. There is upland rice, there is sorghum, there is maize, there are chickpeas, there are pigeon peas and uh, odd pineapple in between. If the maize is failing due to too little rainfall, because the rainfall is very erratic in that area, maybe the sorghum will pick up. Rice will do well if the rains are really good. And in that way, you get a spreading of the risk. And I was uh, working as a researcher at that time. I thought I knew it better, but I came to the conclusion that those farmers, they, knew, they know quite a lot, in fact. And I learned quite a lot from these farmers. I will show you later another example of how the farmers do know systems very well and the only thing as an expert you can advise is perhaps on difficult chemical problems but usually land management is done very well by these people. This farmer was complaining that sometimes he gets surface sealing. Surface sealing, you know what that is? That the surface of the soil becomes really impervious and I thought how is that possible on a sandy soil? I thought sandy soils are usually very permeable and uh, the water will infiltrate very fast. And the farmer told me, no, sometimes I get a lot of runoff and erosion here, even on my field, which looks like rather flat at first glance. So I followed him to one of the features he wanted to show me. And that's, look here. This is quite a gully developing. And look at these roots of these trees at the surface. Do you think those roots were growing at the surface when this tree was planted? Not at all. Here I can read that this tree was planted at least 50 centimeters deeper in the beginning. And at the lifetime of the tree, which was perhaps 50 years, more than 50 centimeters of soil has disappeared from the soilscape there. So that farmer brought me home to me that there is a real sustainability issue there. Soil erosion in a place where I could not expect it to happen. So I looked into the process. How in heavens is this possible? So I did a little experiment with my colleague researchers and we looked at the soil profile. It's very sandy at the top, but after a rain shower we came back and we put together in a little shovel the top millimeter of the soil, and that's almost like pure quartz. And then you go a little bit deeper and you find a little clay pavement. So whenever the rain is falling, you get 
mechanical sorting of the fines and the coarse materials. The coarse go up and the fines go down. Have you done ever the experiment by taking a bowl of rice and put some peanuts in it and you just stir it after five minutes all the peanuts are up. The same principle happens here. All the coarse materials come to the surface and your clay surface is just below and when then the water comes on the soil it runs off like from the tile of a roof and all the water concentrates in the little uh, lows in the plateau and they cut inside and you get these unbelievable gullies to form. So erosion rates unbelievably fast. I saw similar things in Nigeria, by the way, on similar kinds of soils. So what can you do about this? How to manage this land? Well, again, keep vegetation as much as possible. And certainly the cashew helps because it, it, it covers, it breaks the force of the heavy droplets falling in the soil, but there is other things you can do. And again, I learned it from the farmer. The farmer is putting all his land in beds and furrows, not open beds and furrows, tight beds and furrows. So these are like little basins. So the water can fall inside and it will infiltrate here. It cannot run off anymore. They put a lot of effort in doing that and it's the only way if you want to preserve your land. So just to tell you, indigenous knowledge certainly is worthwhile listening to. There's a lot of lessons to learn and certainly here you can see then again the cashew and mango trees which are really part and parcel of that landscape. So more of these trees of course together with this management system is uh, ensuring sustainability. However, the cashew. When I arrived there in 1980, I came to the consultation, constatation that the yields of this cashew were deplorably low. Deplorably low, why? Because there was a fungus, oidium, is the white sickness they call it, which is in fact coming on the flowers of those trees. Here you can see the cashew intercropped with rice. They are standing in the field there, scattered all over the place. And although these trees are promising at the beginning of the dry season, usually, then they flower, all of a sudden they are invaded by this fungus, which is in fact drying out the flowers and uh, drying them out like here. And there is only a few cashew nuts um, preserved. So what, what do the farmers do there? They have learned from the Italian researchers that you can blow on sulfur onto these flowers before the fungus arrives and the sulfur together with the dew of the morning will produce uh, sulfur dioxide which is highly toxic toxic gas which eventually uh, will kill the fungus and they managed to harvest then up to 60 kilograms of cashew per tree which again is a provisional solution but is that a good solution on a feralic arenosol or an arenic acrisol? Soils which have a low cation exchange capacity, which have a low buffer capacity, throwing on sulfur, not in small quantities, 100 kilograms per hectare per year they were applying. What do you think? Again, here we are running into a time bomb. Eh? So we researched it with the researchers from Nali and Delhi Agricultural Research Institute, that's the big institution dealing with cashew nuts in Tanzania. And we came to the conclusion that this uh, S plus Theobacillus is next to the SO2, which is there for protecting the cashew, is producing too much sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid is entering into the soil and in a matter of 10 years, you get a 1 unit, 1.5, up to 2 units of pH drop. Is that affecting the cashew nuts? Luckily not, because the cashew are going very deep with their roots. But it's affecting the food crops. So after 10 years, no more maize, no more wheat, no, no more um, uh, pigeon peas, no more sorghum, 
No more chickpeas, no more nothing. No more food crops. Even the pineapple was suffering. So that means either cash crop or food or something else. So what did we do as researchers? We at least forewarned the politicians, please be careful with this treatment here. Are there other solutions? So we tried to steer the research into finding ways to uh, reduce the vulnerability of the cashew. And I will show you how we did it. Instead of having this cashew planted very close to each other in a closed canopy where the air stays damp under the tree canopies, we planted them more spacely like here. And we also pruned the lower branches a little bit more that the air could better um, dry out the moisture which was accumulating there and that reduced the vulnerability of these trees for the fungus. That is one practical measure you can do, avoiding to use the sulfur. The other thing which uh, was done in the research center is to breed for genetic resistance against the oidium fungus and that again has resulted in new strains, new uh, um, gene genotypes of cashew which now is uh, being propagated and uh, distributed among the farmers. So agronomic, agronomic uh, solutions sometimes are better than just a chemical treatment which may really compromise on the environment as we have seen in this case. Last but not least, I want to show you another dry area here, which is very interesting, the Namib. Are there questions at this stage? We can break a few minutes for, for questions, eh? if you uh, prefer to ask questions now, or shall I continue a bit? Yes? I have a question about phosphate. Uh, do, you, do you try to use mycorrhizal fungi to collate the soil with this? Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, question. I believe in mycorrhiza for various uh, reasons. In fact, uh, not only to have the phosphate perhaps uh, a bit more available, but uh, also for resistance uh, to diseases. Um, we are on a new research track now of uh, mycorrhiza and uh, banana diseases and on coffee. Uh, research was, was also uh, done in that southwestern Ethiopia on the link between the health of the coffee and the mycorrhiza in this uh, coffee forest uh, systems. So there is some very interesting results in that and I'm, I'm sure there's still much more to be researched on that. Yeah, are you a soil biologist maybe? No, but there are a lot of research in Switzerland about this kind of mycorrhiza yeah. and the resistance and the the mobility of the phosphate, and I know they are doing some projects also in Africa. Yeah, it would be very interesting to, to learn more about that. If our project, we are, we are just submitting a project proposal on that one, I was working on it yesterday. So if it comes through, I should have your, your mail address and we should contact, get in contact about this. Yes, there is a group of uh, Frost and Emmanuel in Zurich. Yeah, in ETH. In the ETH. Are you from ETH? No, no. I, I have a good contact with them. Oh, that's very really interesting. Deep in this kind of uh, subject. Yeah, I really think there's still a lot to discover on that. Eh? And uh, a lot not understood properly. Um, so uh, there, is, there has been some research in IIT also on the mycorrhiza, uh, uh, mycorrhiza and then maize and uh, soya by Sanginga, who is now the director of IIT. Uh, he did uh, quite a, a bit of research. I was involved in that research at a certain stage as well. So it's indeed, but still not sufficiently documented, I think. Yeah. Thank you for the good question. Are there other questions? No? If not, I will continue a bit. We can discuss a little bit later as well. So um, we are now in the southern part of Africa in the drier part of Africa. And I can see already uh, 
soils like arena soils, calci soils, lepto soils, dirty soils, dirty pans, soils with silica pans, and on the older soil maps of FAO, I don't know why they are not here anymore, we found large tracts of gypsy soils as well, typically soils of drier areas, solon chucks of course, in the Kalahari area. So uh, why is it so dry in that part of Africa? Well, it has a lot to do with the cold Benguela Gulf Stream, which is moving up here, lining the uh, western coast of the southern African continent, bringing in uh, cold uh, air, so little energy for eva evaporation and uh, high pressure zones. So therefore, the whole area is starved by for lack of rain it can be cloudy but uh, or misty sometimes but usually not sufficiently uh, um, moist and loaded for causing rainfall to drop so the result is that we find um, sand on the move these are huge dunes up to 200 250 meters tall this is our world reference base group doing an exploration there on the demand of uh, the NAMIP and the South African soil scientists. And uh, it's always like a little miracle when you are on the move there that all of a sudden it starts raining. They call me the rainmaker these days. It happens sometimes in other deserts as well. It's really very strange. But uh, it was not very much the rainfall. <coughs> and that gave me the opportunity to look what happens when it rains in such white sand. Here you can see a drop of water, which is just standing on the sand. It is not even infiltrating. So the sandy dunes, like the one you are seeing here, is hydrophobe. If it rains, rain is not entering. It just runs down like from uh, a roof. The other discovery for myself was to see the Welwitzia, the well-known uh, desert plant which is flowering maybe once every six or seven years. And the plants, the, the leaves, they, they sh shrivel until the rain starts and then it grows a little bit more. So it's really a, quite a, a remarkable plant, that one. And then the soils on the marine terraces, which we visited. In fact, uh, it's a stepped landscape on that side as well, with a beautiful marine terrace towards the Indian Ocean. And on the, Indian, on the terrace of the Indian Ocean, you have beautiful desert pavement. Yeah, I mean, when you have sand somewhere else, that means the sand is blown from somewhere. You have very strong winds from the sea into the land. And here you get all the coarse materials which are uh, left behind sometimes with a little bit of desert varnish. So stony topsoil with desert varnish. And below that, a relatively shallow soil with that some 50, 60 centimeters deep uh, accumulation horizon of something. So we looked at it carefully under the magnifying glass and very clearly you can see the swallow tailed crystals of gypsum. It is dissolving in water, so certainly gypsum, but also very often limestone, lime, I mean, accumulations, so calcisols are typical for the environment. Sometimes in the lower parts of the landscape, sol solonchaks, and in many, many places, durisols. So having a real duripan, and the duripan really looks, at first glance, in that part, at least the ones I've seen, like a plintosol, but the uh, coagulating agent is more silica in a combination with iron. So that's how I have uh, preserved the duripan. I will show you some picture of that later on. This is a typical example of the gypsum lamellae. Sometimes you can still see the prints of the seashells because it's a marine terrace, which is a mussel shell here, completely impregnated with uh, gypsum in that area. <coughs> I was wondering where is all this gypsum coming from? Let me tell you a little tale there. So this is the landscape. Where is all this gypsum coming from? 
I take you a few slides earlier, I was discussing with a geologist, Piet de Venter. Have you ever met Piet de Venter, Stefan? Very interesting person. And he told me this gypsum is coming from the ocean. I said, how come from the ocean? Can you explain? He said, sometimes the villages, fishery villages, because it's full of fish here, fishery villages who are lining the coast here have to move away from the coast due to an unbelievable smell of rotten eggs. H2S, sulfur. Where is that coming from? From algal blooms. Here you can see fresh water and algal blooms just in front of the coast. The algae grow very fast. A lot of fish eating the algae. They can't even finish the algae. And whatever is left is just going down into a very deep anaerobic environment do anaerobic yeasting and they form huge quantities of H2S gas which is bubbling up sometimes in some times of the year and that comes with the wind on the land and then with the mist it is lining the marine terrace uh, with some droplets the odd rainfall the gypsum it's oxidizing and the gypsum or reacting it's forming sulfuric acid and with all the shells on the mar marine terrace, it's reacting into gypsum. It's as simple as that. So huge, thousands of hectares of uh, gypsy souls in that part of the world with a kind of a beautiful history, I would say, to understand why they are there. And then last but not least, we have not yet touched on the Mediterranean areas of Africa where we have the winter rainfalls. Here was one part and in North Africa in the Maghreb countries like Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, some part of Egypt, winter rainfalls. This rainfall in the coldest part of the year. So on the maps you will find luvisols, chromic luvisols. Why chromic? Because they are dominated by iron oxides, hematite, dehydrated iron. And that reflects the very soaring heat during the summer days. Very hot and all the iron de uh, oxides de dehydrate. The, the original parent material can be a lot. It can be marine terraces. It can be some lust perhaps coming from the atlas here or from Drakensberg. There is a, a very, but the common thing is that soils are developing with a clay enrichment in the subsoil which are reddish in color and therefore they are also 2-1 clays. That means high activity clays. So high base saturation because it's in a relatively dry environment. So potentially very, very good soils I would say. And perhaps in the Roman Greek times, 2,000, 3,000 years ago, a large area of that environment was very, very good land. These are the chromic luvisols I witnessed in Tunisia, planted to <coughs> olives, but you have also fig, tactu fig cactus and all kinds of vegetables and fruits, citrus fruits, very beautiful. I mean, this is rich or planted to winter wheat, rich environment. So clay en enrichment, a large quantity of organic matter there. In the, I'm sure in Algeria you must have comparable soils, eh? Yeah, and fertile as well. In South Africa, in certain places you do have comparable soils. That's the ones we saw together in a world reference base, uh, chromic luvisols, and planted to grapes. Where in heavens would they better grow the grapes which, and the wine which they are exporting all over the world? But also vegetables, they are exporting the, the rooibos, rooibos uh, tea for instance, but that is growing on 
poorer soils than the Louis soils. That is more on the marginal chromicambi soils. They grow the roy bush. Now what I was surprised, this is late Otto Spargaren in the excursion, and he is standing his foot on a ploughed duty soil. This is how the duty pan looks like. It's like a silica slab which is sitting below the soil and the soil reacts like a shallow soil unless you plough it. But here they, they have been bulldozing these soils. I've seen other places where they do this. And below that you have good fine materials. And having that coarse material, they will just cover it with some soil they steal somewhere else, put some drip irrigation on top of that. And then just at the right time of the year when the grapes are ripening, they will stop irrigation and the, the grapes get the stress. And that's how you produce the right quantity, the right quality for a good Grand, grand Cru of whichever wine you want to produce. So that is producing good wine, ladies and gentlemen. Having the right pruning, the right technical uh, irrigation, non-irrigation, and the right plant uh, feeding and everything. So in this dirty soil, which originally was designated as, as worse than useless, you can turn it into an opportunity if you manage to work with some extra soil here and then some um, judicious quantity of irrigation water. I'm going to uh, end my talk here by an overall slide on Africa, some reflection here <coughs> on uh, the hunger, global hunger index. So from this map, and the other parts of the world. You can see here that whatever is in the red is a big problem in uh, relation to feeding the people. <coughs> there are large tracts of uh, Africa where people are not able to uh, feed themselves. This, this slide comes from the International Food Policy Research Institute and uh, it is uh, depicting the countries to meet the Millennium Goal. So it's a slide which is now a little bit old, but it's still telling quite a, an actual story. Uh, the countries in the red have very little, little progress. Countries like Central Africa, Congo, for instance. Countries where which are having a problem with war. Somalia certainly is also a little bit of a problem. It's not even calculated. Uh, but many, many countries in Africa do uh, have little progress. That is changing, I must say. Some countries, like East, in East Africa, Ethiopia has a growth rate of 10% per year. Tanzania is moving very fast. Um, but still, many, many sub-Saharan countries have a problem of uh, malnutrition of the children. In Benin, for instance, where I'm presently working, more than 50% of the children are malnourished. Qualitatively, quantitatively, they are having enough food, but there is a lack of protein in their uh, menu every day, which leads to stunted growth and also intellectual retardedness, which is compromising those kids for the rest of their life. So there is really something to be done, I think, and I think it's our responsibility also of all who are sitting here to try to do something about it. And I think the soil science, applied soil science, science, as I tried to explain you, addressing issues of sustainability, ad addressing sustainable agriculture in combination with biodiversity is part and parcel of the answer next to politics, of course, because this slide also shows that whenever politics are not in order, like in the central part of Africa, like in Mali, certainly uh, Nigeria with Boko Haram, uh, things will not change and uh, the problem will still remain. So in conclusion, I want to say that there is certainly a causal relationship between the potential of the land and the soilscapes we have been discovering of, uh, in Africa. Most of the soils we have encountered are very old. That means they are relatively low in the 
cation exchange capacity, strongly weathered, and therefore potentially they have limitations to be uh, overcome. And in many uh, research you will read then, yeah, why don't you apply organic matter that will increase the exchange complex and that will solve a lot of problems. That may be quite true, but organic matter has to be produced somewhere. And you can only steal fertility from one corner and bring it into the other corner and then do better there. That I have given you a few examples of how that happened. For instance, in the Uzambaras in Tanzania, you can steal, but you can do, not do that too much because then if you steal the forest soil, also the forest will start growing less and nothing can be done unpunished punished like that. There is nothing like a free lunch. So plant nutrition, certainly balanced plant nutrition in sub-Saharan Africa, with perhaps some external inputs, will be part and parcel of the solution. I would argue that understanding the reference soils with the qualifiers and soil mapping will be part and parcel of understanding the sustainability of the systems to sustain people. Uh, we cannot look at these systems in isolation. We cannot just talk about agricultural systems. You also have to take the biodiversity into account. I started as an agronomist in FAO for 10 years. Now I am more of a biologist, I think because my latest projects are always the combination of biodiversity conservation together with agriculture. And in that way you get into more equilibri equilibrated systems. And the holistic approach is very important in there. And also the holistic approach in terms of area. You cannot just solve a spot. You have to look at the whole catchment or even beyond the catchment to come to good solutions. Then uh, a last uh, thing I'm concluding here is that large parts of African soilscapes remain underexplored. And I came to that discovery, I knew it more or less, but when we were making the soil map of Africa. So this is the map, the latest map of Africa we made a few years ago, thanks to the Joint Research Center in ISPRA, in uh, the EU Research Center. And with Arwin Jones there, we have been working together with Isrik Sparkaren was there as well with the soil, the harmonized soil map, brought all the data together and for some countries we really realized there is still a lot of work to be done. So uh, certainly uh, we should bring the modern techniques of remote sensing, even detailed topography, GIS together under one roof, together with specialists who know the field to come to quick progress. I mean, it's not normal that in an area here, like in central part of Congo, we have only one soil unit. I mean, that's ridiculous. There is much better to do than that. And I'm sure if we were bringing all the databases together, which we find now on the internet, together with the 3D models, and that with a little bit of ground truthing, we can make much more detailed soil maps. I am taking on the challenge. I want to end my story by telling you that we, in, in term, in, to celebrate the International Year of the Soil, we organized in our university together with ISRIC, we are doing so much together with ISRIC, and the Joint Research Center, um, an exhibition Africa in profile. And we used that exhibition to launch the French version of the Atlas of Africa, Soil Atlas of Africa. We had very big shots opening the ministry. The, the, uh, we had the uh, late president of the EU, Herman van Rompuy, coming there. Our minister of uh, development cooperation was there. There were rectors of universities. There were hundreds of people, soil scientists from all the world, who came to visit that uh, exhibition. We shipped from ISRIC more than 30 soil profiles to establish them there, some of these soils you will be working on uh, over the next days, but it was a big success, I tell you. And thanks to the work of ISRIC, we have been able, ISRIC has been able to digitize this uh, exhibition. Now it's online and I'm sure Stefan Mantel will show you the key on how to visit it. There's a lot of information there and you will find more in-depth 
information on the soils of Africa than what I've been explaining so far. So there is still more room for discussion, but so far I want to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.